exhibit Koala Arts and Crafts Mutual Tradition and Innovation will open this Saturday, November 14th. And we're gonna to get to see some behind the scenes on that exhibit shortly in this presentation. And then next Saturday, we're opening the exhibit Drawing from Life, Ben Long and Tony Griffin. This exhibit looks at the work of two North Carolina artists and lifelong friends, Ben and Tony. They both lived and work in Blowing Rock for many years and they were active in the local artistic community. Uh, ben is best known for his large scale fresco work and Tony is an established painter and illustrator of portraits and landscapes. But rather than focusing on their well-known works, this exhibit will explore Ben and Tony's long-term relationship, their ties to Blowing Rock, and specifically their figurative and portrait drawings. And this exhibit will open November 21st. Um, but today we're learning about Koala Arts and Crafts Mutual Tradition and Innovation. In this talk, we'll examine the founding and development of Koala Arts and Craft Mutual Incorporated. Koala Arts and Crafts Mutual Incorporated is the oldest Native American cooperative in America. Um, it was founded in 1946, and it continues to uphold a standard of excellence when it comes to the traditional arts and crafts of the Eastern Band of Cherokee. Showcasing the work of over 250 members, Koala Arts and Crafts Mutual preserves and promotes the traditional arts and crafts of the Eastern Band of Cherokee. And so today we're gonna to hear from Anna Ferriello and Pam Meister. Um, and just some background about our speakers. Anna Ferriello is a curator of over 30 exhibitions, an author of seven books, numerous book chapters and articles, presenter of over 150 conference papers and invited lectures, and director of over 30 federal, state, and private grants. She is a former Smithsonian Fellow and Fulbright Scholar and former Associate Professor at three state universities. At Western Carolina University, she curated yeah. half a dozen digital exhibits and collect in online collections and exhibits. Anna has been honored with the 2010 Brown Hudson Award from the North Carolina Folklore Society, a 2013 Guardians of Culture Award from the Association of Tribal Archives and Museums, a 2016 Preservation Excellence Award from the North Carolina Preservation Consortium, and a 2019 Lifetime Achievement Award from the Southern Highland Craft Guild. She holds a Bachelor of Arts in Art from Rutgers University, a Master's of Art in Museum Studies and Art History from Virginia Commonwealth University, and a Master's of Fine Arts from James Madison University. And we're also honored to have Pam Meister. Pam is the director of the Mountain Heritage Center at Western Carolina University, and she has worked at the Mountain Heritage Center um, at the Western Carolina University's Museum of Southern Appalachian Culture and History since 2010. She's currently leading the MH3, MHC through a major transition, operating the museum in temporary quarters while planning a new permanent facility, developing a regional outreach program, and expanding the scope of the Mountain Heritage Center's services to kindergarten through 12th grade students and university students. A veteran museum professional, she has held leadership positions at museums in Georgia, South Carolina, and North Carolina as well as serving as executive director of the Southeastern Museums Conference and the Louisiana Association of Museums. She's a founding faculty member of Southeastern Museum Conference's Jekyll Island Museum Institute and for the past 10 years has coordinated SEMC's annual Student Work in Museums Award Program, an award-winning peer reviewer for the American Alliance of Museums Pam has also served as a grants reviewer for the Institute of Museum and Library Services, the National Endowment for the Humanities, and the Georgia Council of the Arts. In 2014, she was honored to receive the James R. Short Award for Lifetime Achievement from SEMC. Her 42-year career in cultural resource management has also included positions with the National Endowment for the Arts and as a the theatrical costumer stage manager and general manager of dance and theater companies in New Orleans, Los Angeles, and Atlanta. A native of New Orleans, she holds a Bachelor of Arts degree in theater with a minor in history and from the University of New Orleans and a Master's of Fine Art in Arts Management from the University of Georgia. So we're honored to have uh, Anna and Pam today. Uh, so please join me in welcoming Anna Ferriello and Pam Meister. Thank you so much, Willard and Lee and the Blowing Rock 
um, Art and History Museum for inviting us. Um, my, um, I hope, I want my talk to be informative. I also hope um, it is uh, both educational and entertaining. I'm going to be speaking on the uh, history of Kuala Arts and Crafts as, as an organization. So uh, prior to the formation of Kuala Arts and Crafts um, in the early 20th century, before the creation of the Guild in the 1940s, the way that artisans sold their work is they had to carry the work to neighboring towns or resorts or they sold directly from their homes. Um, so this is uh, Nancy Bradley. She walked from Soko, which is on the uh, edge of the, uh, the eastern edge of the Kuala boundary, and she would walk from Soko either into Cherokee or Waynesville to sell her baskets. I mean, we're talking probably 30 miles. Um, we have um, other quotes from other artisans. Bessie Jumper recalled, quote, we went over the mountain, we'd leave at five o'clock in the morning. So this was a um, difficult way to make a living. Another, um, uh, another means of, of selling their work was uh, selling from their home and especially some products like pottery and wood, which were either heavy or breakable. Uh, carrying your work to these resorts was not really a, val uh, a viable option. So um, people sold from their front porch, as you see Johnson Catalster woodcarver here and Ethel Big Meat uh, Potter. When boarding schools were first established at the end of the um, 19th century, they were, um, they were very restrictive. I think many of you have heard some of the stories, horror stories really, about how they forbade uh, Native people from speaking their language or celebrating their traditions or even just practicing their traditions in a, in a private manner. Later, um, around the first decade of the 20th century, they began to reverse their course, allowing for the teaching of Cherokee arts and crafts. Although, as we can see in this photograph of Arizona Sweeney, who as a young uh, girl went to Hampton Institute, um, you know, and many of these children were forcibly removed from their homes to attend these schools. She uh, attended Hampton Institute and then later taught um, uh, basket weaving there. But you can kind of see the dichotomy here. She is uh, dressed in this very proper uh, Victorian outfit, very uh, non-Cherokee dress. It wasn't until the 1930s that crafts was taught um, at the Cherokee boarding school. And in 1931, the first craft that was introduced was loom weaving. Again, we see this uh, kind of bizarre um, dichotomy of the fact that loom weaving was certainly not a tradition of the Cherokee, but it was thought to be what every girl uh, should learn. Um, and it was, um, you know, very necessary uh, prior to the 30s to, to know how to weave cloth to make uh, clothing. But by this time, it, it was really um, not a necessity. Uh, but nevertheless, that was what was first introduced. In 1935, going back, Chiltoski began teaching wood carving, and uh, soon after, Lottie Stamper began teaching basket weaving. And these programs lasted into the 1960s. Um, an outsider named Gertrude Flanagan was responsible for the, this, this sort of umbrella program, and these were all taught under home economics. And she was um, an outsider who, um, wrote a thesis on Indian work and was hired by the Bureau of Indian Affairs to oversee these programs. In 1934, um, a new principal chief was elected, Jarrett Blythe, and um, as a consequence, they were also building a new council house. And this was the first opportunity to have a kind of public face of Cherokee crafts, because when the council house opened in 1934, it included a room set aside for the display of crafts. Of course, it was only open during the summer months as um, Cherokee, even today, you, it's difficult to go through the park uh, in the winter. And uh, back then, I, I would imagine, you know, the, the town was literally closed down due to the weather. 
Another um, opportunity for um, artisans to sell their work was at the um, Indian Fair, which uh, began in 1914 and has been, um, it's an annual event ever since, still going on today. And here we see Maud Welch, Nancy Bradley, and Eva Wolf at the 1941 fair. I don't know the woman at the far right. Um, and just coincidentally, um, he's not noted in this picture, but the man standing at the end of the table is Alan Eaton, who wrote the uh, very seminal uh, kind of, um, uh, Bible, I guess you might say, called um, on uh, Southern Arts and Crafts, uh, called the um, Crafts in the Southern Highlands. And it's uh, a book he wrote in 1937 that's still used by scholars today. So in 1934, the Great Smoky Mountains National Park was established. Um, this uh, little map on the left shows the locations of the national parks in the U.S. And on the right, that's uh, FDR uh, speaking at the a dedication of the park in 1940. Well, what this did was it placed the Kuala Boundary at this intersection because the Blue Ridge Parkway, the Kuala Boundary, and the Great Smoky Mountains National Park all come together. Um, and this was really the, be, the real beginning of the boom of tourism in um, Cherokee. And so you can see um, the this idea that the Cherokee could be a part of the park. Um, one of the suggestions was that they could be an interesting feature of the park. Um, I, I don't have enough time to kind of go into that kind of thinking, but um, it, it both helped and uh, hindered uh, the, the, the authenticity of traditions in the, uh, on the Kuala Boundary. And ex so just to give an example of where I was going with that is one unintended consequence of this um, growing tourism was the idea to, um, to kind of present Cherokee people in the kind of cowboys and Indians tradition and a real fabrication of tradition. So on the left, <coughs> we have a photograph of a family posing with an Indian chief and I've put that in quotation marks, uh, wearing a Western style headdress, and on the right, a postcard uh, with another Western style headdress and um, uh, Cherokee people standing in front of a teepee, which was never ever a part of uh, Cherokee life. <laughs> Um, there was a book um, titled Public Indians, Private Cherokees about uh, tourism and tradition on tribal land uh, that addresses this issue. Does mass tourism perpetuate the us versus them mindset or is tourism in the business of educating the public about unique indigenous histories? Um, there's definitely a, a, a conflict there. Um, that same photograph, uh, postcard of the fabricated traditions on the right and above, um, these are the Cherokee friends. Um, they're um, standing in Kadua. Uh, that's Mike Crow. Um, they uh, carefully research costumes and traditions, and this is um, the 21st century um, sharing of tradition with the public. And they often wander the streets of Cherokee to answer questions. So in 1935, sort of in recognition of these conflicts, uh, the U.S. established, uh, well, the Bureau of Indian Affairs established the Indian Arts and Crafts Board, uh, which is, uh, remains today an agency of the, um, of the U.S. government. It was charged with, quote, promoting the economic welfare of Indian tribes through the development of Indian arts and crafts and an expansion of the market for products of Indian art and craftsmanship. Uh, one of the things that the Indian Arts and Crafts Board continues to do today, and in fact, it's probably their most um, significant uh, aspect of their operation, is they um, authenticate um, uh, craft and art by uh, American Indians. So uh, that's a big problem with tribes, people um, creating work uh, and reproducing it and trying to pass it off as Indian arts. 
the Cherokee um, sort of gained uh, some national <coughs> exposure at the um, San Francisco World's Fair in 1939 when Roxana Stamper, an Eastern Band Cherokee uh, weaver, exhibited this beautiful blanket. It's called Road to Soco. Um, and you know, you can see these sort of zigzags. Um, and, and those of you who've been to Western North Carolina know that um, that's how, you know, that's not that far-fetched to depict our roads in this way. Um, and uh, she wove this uh, blanket. Um, it is, um, in the collection of Koala Arts and Crafts, actually. It's a beautiful piece. One of the other issues um, that I found in doing my research, always been a little uh, detrimental <coughs> to the presentation of Indian arts, is this what I call the reattribution of function. Um, this was the first art exhibit ever in the U.S on Native American arts. It was at the Museum of Modern Art called Indian Art of the United States. Um, and it was um, in 1941, there was a catalog as well. And this was one of the issues. Uh, well, there were really two issues. You can see uh, the caption here, Cherokee Wastebasket, North Carolina not only lent anonymously, is not even attributed to the artist. Um, so this is, uh, unfortunately, was very common in the mid 20th century to exhibit Cherokee arts um, and uh, give the artist attribution as the tribal affiliation and not mention the artist's name at all. The other uh, real shame about this is the, this reattribution of function, um, I feel, devalues the meaning of indigenous cultural objects by assigning them mundane functions. Um, and, and so this, uh, this is a traditional storage basket, uh, renamed a waste basket um, to sort of promote its context in contemporary life and also promote its um, ability to be sold. Um, but at the same time, sort of stripping it of its potential spiritual and cultural significance. So in um, 1945, uh, the, a, a new principal chief, Jarrett Blythe, he's seen it right and the, um, at the right, and um, the agency superintendent, Joe Jennings, at left. They began holding meetings, quote, to extend arts and crafts on the Kuala boundary. And um, I'm sure Joe Jennings was uh, encouraged to do this by the Bureau of Indian Affairs and the Indian Arts and Crafts Board, because this, um, now we're directly talking about Cherokee. Uh, what is the normal or potential capacity for arts and crafts, they wondered. The artisans that attended the first meeting in 1945 were Lucy George. She's pictured there. She is a uh, basket weaver who worked almost exclusively in um, honeysuckle. Wadi Choltoski, a uh, carver. Uh, Lizzie Youngbird, basket weaver. Carolyn Wolf and Lottie Stamper, both basket weavers. These were the artisans that attended those meetings. One suggestion that came up repeatedly was to provide raw materials to artisans through cooperative purchase, um, because that would be something that would help them directly. This is Elsie Wadi uh, cutting a white oak uh, to make a basket, where you can see her standing tall with her double bit axe. And uh, on the right, Molly Blankenship and Nancy Consine, um, a basket weaver. Molly Blankenship was a cultural advocate. And this photograph is actually at the dedication in the 1970s of the dedication of the Folk Arts Center on the Blue Ridge Parkway it was a, um, a large opening that many Cherokee uh, attended as demonstrators. Uh, this was um, also from the minutes of some of these meetings. More will be, will be paid for baskets which use root dyes rather than commercial dyes. And this was a big uh, push to maintain the authenticity of tradition. And here we see uh, Emma Taylor, again with a double bit axe, uh, taking the bark off of a black walnut tree. And uh, these four uh, 
uh, native plants, bloodroot, yellowroot, black walnut, and butternut um, form the palette that uh, has existed um, throughout Cherokee and continues today as the main dye stuffs used uh, for weaving. And the basket is by Eva Wolf. It's a double weave basket. <coughs> It's difficult to know what the true thoughts of those Cherokee craftsmen who attended these organizational meetings. Um, the outsider, Gertrude Flanagan, who I, meant, who I mentioned earlier, um, and actually she became the manager of, the first manager of Kuala Arts and Crafts. She ran the meetings. Um, all the responses were recorded by um, Jennings, uh, BIA superintendent Jennings secretary, Alice Seaver. Um, and you know, so, at the meeting discussions were kind of mediated through um, these three outsiders. Nevertheless, um, these are um, the minutes and the records um, that we have for research. So it was in 1946 that the group, um, and you know, I'm, I'm being generous here by saying the group drafted a constitution and bylaws at a meeting on August 23rd, and they were signed by everyone present. Um, and my, the generosity of my statement is likely those were drawn up by Flanagan and Jennings. Um, nevertheless, 59 charter members agreed to form, uh, to voluntarily associate together to promote our social welfare and, quote, promote the heritage of our tribe. And the 59th name on the list was Rebecca Youngbird, and this is her effigy pot um, on the right. Um, this statement on the right is the full um, statement that they signed. Um, and so the group elected uh, Mac Ross as its first president, and here he is seen with Cora Juanita, a potter. So the first uh, building that, uh, so here we have this organization, it didn't really have a home. Um, the, in 1949, uh, there was a, um, uh, a development created by the tribe called the Boundary Tree Development. Uh, today, it is the uh, New Kadua Academy, which is the immersion school. But during the first years of its operation, this small building in the front where you see the gas station, the front part of it, um, was Koala Arts and Crafts, and they, um, uh, so they had a street front uh, for the first time. In 1955, they were incorporated um, and became, uh, took the name that they have today, which is Koala Arts and Crafts Mutual Incorporated, uh, formerly uh, part of uh, North Carolina, state of North Carolina. In 1960, um, they built a building, uh, which is the building that they are located in today, although it's been renovated a couple of times. Um, in 1968, they paid off their loan, so they own their own building. Uh, Gertrude Flanagan and Cecilia Taylor were uh, co-op managers until Betty Dupree came in 1972. And you know, Betty uh, was manager for um, uh, into the, 90s when uh, Vicki Cruz became uh, co-op manager and she's the current uh, manager today. So even though the co-op is uh, approaching its uh, 70th anniversary, there have been uh, very few directors and it's been a um, uh, fairly uh, very stable organization. In 1969, the co-op began sponsoring its own exhibition program. Uh, this was funded by the Indian Arts and Crafts Board and the North Carolina Arts Council. Uh, some of the first shows were uh, by their most uh, accomplished members, uh, River Cane Baskets by Eva Wolf, and then Honeysuckle Baskets by Lucy George, who's shown here, and White Oak Basket um, exhibition by Julia Taylor. And I might note that um, these exhibitions were accompanied by these, um, I mean, they were catalogs. I, I could hardly call them catalogs because they're just uh, like a four page uh, fold over sheet, but they are, um, each of the artists was interviewed. And so there are quotations and uh, dates when these exhibitions happened, uh, lists of artworks. They've been an invaluable resource to my research 
and uh, they are, I believe all of them that we have are scanned and online on the uh, uh, digital collections that I worked on at Western Carolina University. And you can access those by either uh, Googling Craft Revival or Cherokee Traditions. And those are two um, uh, uh, digital collections with uh, thousands of photographs and historic documents that are all there um, for your uh, reading. Um, there, and also in uh, 1970, so this was an exhibition in 1976 uh, to celebrate the opening of a new members gallery. In 1989, uh, the co-op was expanded again. Um, and you can see these, these are fairly contemporary photographs within the last 10 years. Um, they include a, a very large open retail space, a members gallery, a storage area, a classroom space, archival storage, and a significant permanent collection gallery. Um, today's um, Arts and Crafts Co-op finds itself as very proactive representative of the Eastern Band. And this is Tanya Carroll uh, when she was uh, outreach coordinator at the co-op and she was one of the um, co-curators of this exhibit. And that's it for me. Thank you very much. Um, hi, everybody. Um, I'm Pam Meister, and in my portion of the talk today, I'm hoping to give you a little virtual behind the scenes look at what goes into developing a museum exhibit and how museum collections can grow and change over time and the various ways in which museum collections can be used. Those of us who work in museums know people are always like, what do you do with all that stuff that's in storage? Um, well, um, I hope to talk a little bit about that today. Um, as uh, mentioned, I came to the Mountain Heritage Center 10 years ago, um, and at first I was curator. I became um, a director a little later on, but um, as curator, one of the very first exhibits that I was assigned to develop was one commemorating the 65th anniversary of Koala Arts and Crafts Mutual, affectionately known around Cherokee as the Co-op. Um, I was delighted to work on an exhibit featuring the work of Eastern Band artists because of my previous involvement with a major exhibit project, Native Lands, Indian and, and Georgia, um, which uh, was done when I was Director of Education and Interpretation for the Atlanta History Center. This was um, really large exhibit that was guest curated by Sarah Hill, who's the author of Weaving New Worlds, Southeastern Cherokee Women in Their Basketry. And it explored the history and stories of Georgia's original inhabitants, beginning with the Mississippian peoples, and then continuing with their descendants, the Creeks and the Cherokees. This exhibit included many things, including outdoor gardens that were representations of the various agriculture, but also a final concluding section on contemporary Cherokee and Creek artists in Georgia. And so I was very eager after that experience to learn more about their North Carolina counterparts. So I began assessing the Mountain Heritage Center's collections and making contact with co-op staff I ran into a number of surprises. Um, first, although the Mountain Heritage Center's collections were rich in archaeological materials, um, they contained surprisingly few examples of contemporary crafts by koala artists. Um, second, I was amazed by the large number of current um, Koala artist members, which were well over 300 at that point in time, and was also fascinated by the complex family relationships and um, traditions that influenced their work. And so it became clear very early on that I needed help. And um, I was incredibly lucky to find the world's best partners to co-curate the anniversary exhibit. Anna Ferriello was a WCU colleague um, who at the time was director of Hunter Library's digital initiatives 
and a total wealth of information. Um, you know, she had spent, literally wrote the book on Cherokee crafts and had been working with the co-op for years to document that history that you just heard so eloquently summarized just now and um, to organize their permanent collections. And so she was absolutely instrumental in telling the story of Koala's formation and development, as well as explaining all of those family collect connections to me. Um, Koala Arts and Crafts manager Vicki Cruz provided dozens of large format photographs for the initial exhibit. And one thing I must say, you saw that fabulous um, permanent collection um, at Koala, but unfortunately um, that collection is not available for loan. So I wasn't able to use that. And so um, I, we had to find other, other methods of representing the Koala artist there. But uh, as I said, Vicki um, was fabulous in terms of providing dozens of photographs as well as reading every word of exhibit text to ensure its accuracy and to ensure its tone. And then the co-op's then outreach coordinator, Tanya Carroll, um, who of course is an enrolled member of the Eastern Band and holds bachelor's and master's degree in history from WCU, is also a former Miss Cherokee who grew up working summers at the Oconalofti Indian Village and was uniquely qualified to provide both a historian's and an insider's perspective on this exhibit. So Tanya was also already involved in an ongoing project of creating video interviews of Cherokee artisans and tradition bearers, which became a very important component of later versions of the original exhibit. Now, Anna and Tanya both, let me see if I can, come on, there we go. Anna and Tanya both have amazing personal collections of, of Koala crafts and were extremely generous in lending us many of the objects that were featured in that very first exhibit. You see a little bit of the photographs here as well as um, one of the cases and then the lineup here is Tanya first, followed by Anna, Evelyn Conley, um, legendary koala manager, Betty Dupree, and then yours truly. So um, that was the 65th anniversary exhibit, which was in one of our smaller galleries. Um, we were pleased, however, even though in our limited space that we were able to um, really exhibit a diversity of objects, not just baskets, pottery, and carvings, which I shouldn't say just because it's fabulous, but um, you know, something that I think is, is less widely known are the wonderful textiles that are created and that were used in um, examples of um, 18th century clothing, like this fabulous bandolier bag there, which is a, a contemporary reproduction of 1750s work. Um, you see some, also some finger woven objects here. And um, this exhibit also did include um, some objects that weren't necessarily known as art objects like these stickball sticks and balls, which are so um, representative and evocative of Cherokee culture. And then finally, this exhibit had a little contemporary commentary going on in here. This, this um, little white thing down at the bottom was um, a hand printed wanted poster of um, Andrew Jackson. It says wanted for crimes um, and uh, there's a reward posted. And this was a project of Darren Barks who actually created these posters and went around and stuck them up on light poles and trees um, in the Western North Carolina as um, sort of a, a installation art. And so um, the exhibit was a great success. We were really pleased about that and um, uh, was well received. We had um, good visitation, but then we started getting requests from other North Carolina museums who wanted to know if the exhibit would travel. 
However, because so many of those objects were on loan for a limited time, it wasn't possible, but it really did give the Mountain Heritage Center the incentive to seek funding to apply uh, to acquire more Cherokee crafts for the Mountain Heritage Center's collections and then to use those objects for an expanded traveling exhibit. So thanks to the Cherokee Preservation Foundation for funding that initiative and the Blue Ridge National Heritage Area Partnership for funding the video, the artist video that I mentioned before, we were able to open an expanded exhibit in 2013 in our largest gallery, um, which featured many of the nearly 100 additional Cherokee crafts objects that we had purchased by that time. Most of it with Cherokee Preservation Foundation support, but some of it from um, our own budget as well, and with the guidance of Vicki and the other Koala staff members. And so, this is a photograph of the expanded exhibit. Um, and as you can see, um, considerably more things. And although we kept the photographs, people loved in the initial exhibit seeing photographs of the artist. And what we did in this situation was create groupings that were family groupings. For instance, up against the back wall here, are things that all came from multi-generational members of the same family. And then this is also when we started um, really um, trying to manifest the whole concept of tradition and innovation. Tradition, of course, being the traditional forms, the traditional materials and dyes, but innovation being things like taking the idea of the ribbed baskets that you see down here and up here you see um, a spherical basket that um, is a contemporary take on that same idea. So this was an exhibit that we used as a prototype. Once again, you know, Cherokee crafts are magic. Um, people uh, visitors magically appear. I hope you find about out this Willard that um, you know you're going to have wonderful, wonderful visitation to this exhibit because this is such a marvelous subject. Um, so here is another thing. So um, we very deliberately solicited feedback from our individual visitors from the school groups and the Mountain Heritage Center when there's not COVID going on traditionally sees between um, 2,500 and 3,000 school children in our exhibits per year, um, WCU students and other museum colleagues. We had a particularly good time with those school groups. One of the things that we found elicited some really inf interesting information was to ask them before they went into the exhibit to look at the exhibit and think about if they could take one object home with them, what would it be and why? And then we would debrief them at the end of their exhibit tour. And uh, that was a really fascinating way to get into the heads of, um, you know, second and fourth graders particularly. So with the feedback um, that we got from this exhibit, and that's our little feedback um, station there, what we found out were that people like me, were totally fascinated by the artist. And so um, we actually, during the course of this prototype exhibit, set up this large screen television and made a little viewing station. And we were able to show um, the artist videos. It's an hour long, which um, the Blowing Rock Art and History Museum has the same set of videos. And um, there's 12, I think 12, 11 or 12 little five minute clips of artist and tradition bearers who are represented in the exhibit talking about why they do what they do. And Tanya was the person who was actually doing the interviews. You don't hear her voice on the videos, but it is her questions that have elicited the wonderful statements from the various artists. So that was something. So that was a big goal of this particular exhibit was um, not just to show a diversity of crafts, but also to, in as many ways as possible, 
have a physical representation of the artists in the galleries, in their crafts, in their photographs, and in their videos. And so um, we felt each one of those things reinforced the other. Another thing that everybody was totally interested in was the process of creating these crafts. And so again, um, we made, uh, in addition to the original panels, we made a new set of panels and you see this red panel here is one of them. There were three panels about the process of creating baskets. And so we had Prepare, we had gather was the first one. And again, here is that same photograph of actually cutting down the trees and cutting the splints for white oak baskets here. And then we had a prepare, which showed gathering the materials and making the dye baths and dyeing the various splints. And then the third one was the actual weaving so that people understand that weaving, while extremely important, is only part of a very important process. Something else that we added to this exhibit was a section using some of our archaeological holdings and talking about the, um, the origins of Cherokee crafts and that these crafts were not just hundreds of year old, but in the case of pottery, in stone carvings, we have evidence that they are thousands of years old. So those things were developed in the new exhibit. Um, we also wanted this traveling exhibit to be available to not just, you know, large and mid-sized museums, but particularly to the small museums, some of whom, you know, are just have one or two staff members and might even be volunteer based. And so we designed the traveling exhibit to fit into a cargo van. And um, as they can testify with Blowing Rock, we made it fit into a large SUV, I think, for this particular trip. Um, and so uh, we made a lot of custom mounts and shipping boxes that were created to make sure that the components of this exhibit could be broken down and shipped safely. And here are some of our new acquisitions, including one of my very favorite. Uh, this is a Virgil Crow um, medicine mask that uh, I think is incredibly powerful. When you go see the physical exhibit, and I encourage you to do so, um, you will see this piece from across the room, and I think it will probably speak to you. Um, we were lucky in that um, we were also able, working with the Koala staff, to purchase some works from deceased artists. For instance, the two stone carvings, that one and that one here, um, are um, by John Julius Wilnotti um, Jr., who unfortunately had passed away but was following in his father's footsteps as a stone carver. And Freddie Wilnotti did the pipe there, who thank goodness, is alive and well and creating wonderful art today. Um, so um, uh, I think Anna made the comment, uh, or someone made the comment earlier, Leanne, um, that the, this exhibit looks different every place it goes. And I wanted to show you that one of the places it went to was the Catawba County Museum of History in Hickory, North Carolina. And so you see it here, they have a fabulous exhibit of Catawba crafts of their own that was a complement to this particular exhibit. But uh, they also see, see the artist video going in this particular shot, but on a much smaller television. And uh, so here is another um, room of the Catawba County and there's that Virgil Crow mask um, from across the room. Um, and then we also took components of this exhibit and brought it into non-traditional spaces as well. We created smaller versions of the exhibit panels and this is shown at the Jackson County Public Library Complex in Silva, North Carolina. So again, some of the same artwork, but in a different configuration and a little less of it. 
and then at the I-26 um, North Carolina Visitor Center up in Mars Hill, where this version of the exhibit was up um, with Anna's collaboration. And uh, it was, again, according to the staff there, um, one of the most popular that they have ever had with their visitors. And then finally, um, it moved in from that venue in Mars Hill to the Rural Heritage Museum. And once again, it was very nice. Their um, standing panels in their um, uh, display space exactly uh, matches um, the color scheme of this exhibit. And so we were thrilled about that. So came back full circle to the Mountain Heritage Center. We have a campus theme every year and our campus theme in 2017 was Cherokee. And so we were very pleased to bring the exhibit back to our very own space and um, to show it once again. And um, so that's sort of the story of the exhibit and now it's at Blowing Rock. Um, what we're up to these days and um, something that I believe uh, will be included in, in your exhibit installation is one of our recent acquisitions was um, this woman's um, traditional clothing from 1750 that was created for us. It's a reproduction, of course, created for us um, by um, Nancy and Johnny Ruth Maney. And so um, that adds to the idea of showing all of the various um, craft skills that went into the daily clothing. Um, and I just wanted to talk about new directions that the Mountain Heritage Center is going in right now. We are currently um, working on a big project about river cane and it's important both ecologically and um, to cultural preservation in the Southeast. And we know about that particularly through the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians and Cherokee Preservation Foundation's collaboration with the River Cane Restoration Project. But projects uh, similar to this are going on all over the Southeast. Um, notably, there's a River Cane Restoration Project spearheaded by the University of Georgia's um, Botanical Garden, which is the Georgia State Botanical Garden. There are other projects in Arkansas and Louisiana, and um, the baskets that you see down here are not Cherokee, but um, they are from Louisiana's Chittimacha tribe, and again, are another manifestation of river cane, and, and it's extreme important to traditional native life in the southeastern, what's now the southeastern United States. So um, that's what we're up to. And um, so we are excited to be able to use um, that our collections. And of course, they do when they are not on tour or when they're not on exhibit, they go back into storage. But even in storage, um, there is a life because um, they are documented by photographs and on database and um, they are used a good bit in research. We also use those collections as a teaching tool. Anna talked about um, the reattribution and sometimes the misattribution of Cherokee crafts. And we really have worked particularly um, with the, a geology faculty, I mean, sorry, geography faculty member to talk about um, the, our Cherokee crafts collection in terms of cultural transmission and in terms of adaptation. And so that we're able to use these things and to talk about how traditional burden baskets and storage baskets um, shrank in size for the tourist trade and went from being objects of utility to being commodities. And then to talk about how that fits in with cultural preservation and how these objects are also objects that are culturally extremely important. And so, um, you know, we are able to really spark conversations and create understandings. 